Good afternoon. I'm Michael Brown, president of the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the second of our online salon series. The title today is A Social Diagnosis and Prognosis for COVID-19 with Dr. James Trussell. To help you, you, should, you can tell that I'm broadcasting from home, not from my rather magnificent office at SAR, and that reflects the fact that we're still mostly in work from home mode and the campus is closed. But to maintain connections with our community and beyond, um, during a period of physical distancing, we're offering new ways for you to engage with SAR. We'll be organizing events like this at least once a month, focused on a wide range of topics that are intended to provide new insights into issues of broad social concern. So please check the calendar at SAR, sarweb.org, and your email inboxes if you're on our mailing list for updates. Today's presentation features Dr. James Trossel as he considers the social dimensions of COVID-19, their relationship to the pandemic's epidemiological characteristics, among which are the pandemic's likely long-term social effects and changing attitudes towards the risk of infection. We're grateful to SAR's Founder Society members who provide the financial support for our Creative Thought Forum, of which this is a part. Your contributions also support this program and others like it and are greatly appreciated and will help us to continue to deliver high quality online programs. A couple of uh, housekeeping issues before I introduce Jim. You'll see typically in a panel to the right of your screen um, an opportunity to put questions, to, that is to type questions. Um, a second option is to raise your hand electronically and you'll see that in the attendee section. If you have a microphone on your computer and you're, you're invited to ask your question orally, then you will be allowed to do so. Uh, the questions are gonna be processed by the ever-efficient Lindsay Archuleta backstage, and she'll be sending that to me, and the questions that is to me and to Dr. Paul Ryer, Director of Scholar Programs, will be joining me in the Q&A period. James Trossel is the Scott M. Johnson Class of 97 Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at Trinity College in Hartford. His areas of expertise include cultural perspectives on epidemics, local understandings of risk, and strategies for reconciling policy and practice. He served as a research associate at the Harvard Institute for International Development for seven years prior to his appointment at Trinity College. He was a Weatherhead Resident Scholar at SAR in 2009-2010 and served two terms on SAR's Board of Directors. Among his many publications is the book Epidemiology and Culture, published by Cambridge University Press in 2005. I'm going to mute my microphone and do a, hon a handoff to James Truss. The talk I'll be presenting tonight is called A Social Diagnosis and Prognosis for COVID-19, and I thank you all for giving me the chance to give it. We think of epidemiology as a science that tells us about diseases. The reproductive number for measles, the level of population resistance required to obtain herd immunity from mumps, the duration of infection for polio, the risk of transmitting COVID-19. But epidemiology is a narrative form. It tells stories about how diseases reveal who we are and how our human societies are constructed. These are, at least in part, moral tales. Why do the rich survive while the poor die? Why do friendly people live longer than lonely people? How do our communities help us get healthier? And how do they help us get sick? These are stories about commonalities and differences among humans more than characteristics of a virus. So I want to tell one big epidemiological story about COVID-19, illustrated with a few examples. The big message is that contrary to the way we think about them, epidemics are social events more than natural ones. Epidemics are viral in two senses of the term. They're driven by a readily transmissible infectious agent, but they're also capable of rapidly spreading fear, uncertainty, and compassion. 
Viruses may be readily transmissible, but so are emotions like hope and despair, or information about treatments or prevention practices. In other words, I'm arguing that there are no natural histories of disease, but rather only social histories of disease. Epidemiology, defined as the study of the distribution and determinants of disease in human populations, is also a social science, though many epidemiologists and many newspapers prefer to treat it as a clinical science. So let's start with a standard model of disease progression taught by the Centers for Disease Control, the primary center for epidemiology in the United States. This emphasizes disease as a natural reaction to a causal agent. Moving from left to right in this standard model, an individual body starts in a phase of susceptibility. Then, following exposure to some infectious agent, enters a stage of subclinical disease, which eventually manifests in pathological changes that become noticed as symptoms. Symptom onset leads to a stage of clinical disease, which leads eventually to diagnosis and treatment which results in recovery, disability, or death. So this is a model of the so-called natural history of disease. But human actions and interpretations matter. So let me go through these one by one. Given the presence of an infectious agent or physiological impairment, how does diet or workplace or housing quality or social network structure influence an individual's susceptibility and exposure? What are the behavioral characteristics of so-called superspreaders of disease. Typhoid Mary, the famous example in New York in the late 1800s, was a cook. She was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid, but capable of infecting the people for whom she cooked. Next, given exposure and start of a disease process, what kinds of pain or dysfunction or suffering are recognized as pathological, and which ones aren't? What testing regimes and public health systems allow individuals to detect subclinical disease? Then, given recognition of symptoms, what kinds of suffering are interpreted as normal versus abnormal? What types of delays might extend the time between symptom onset and diagnosis? Given diagnosis, how might different health systems produce different kinds of treatments? And what kinds of health systems produce what kinds of diagnoses? Given some kind of diagnosis and treatment, how do poverty, occupation, or healthcare quality influence an individual's possible recovery? I said there were only social histories of disease. We can also take this individual model of disease progression and think about it at the community level as a kind of population or sociocultural history of disease. This describes transmission at the group rather than the individual level, but still emphasizes the social forces that promote and inhibit outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. So I developed this model to describe the transmission of cholera in the 1990s, but I think it still can be instructive today. In this instance, and let's take COVID-19 as our example, we begin with groups at varying stages of ecological susceptibility. People who by age, occupation, living conditions, income, race, or other traits are differentially likely to expose someone to an infectious agent, even when that agent's presence is unknown or unrecognized. This is the case of China in November 2019 and the United States and Italy in late December of 2019. In this image, taken from the Centers for Disease Control website on January 23, a novel coronavirus is mentioned. But note it's under level one, practice usual precautions. It's mentioned there's an ongoing outbreak of respiratory illness in Wuhan. Person to person spread is mentioned. The situation, we're told, is evolving. At about the same time, the National Enquirer has a headline that the China virus will kill 65 million people. Shortly after that Centers for Disease Control notice, the World Health Organization declared a global emergency. But note in this headline in the New York Times, this was still being called the Wuhan coronavirus, or as President Trump was calling it, the Wuhan virus or the China virus. Soon after that, by February 11, WHO had declared 
we were going to call this COVID-19. And the Times headline says WHO was trying to make no reference to places, animals, or people to avoid stigma. So people then are talking about the origins of COVID-19. Wuhan virus, China virus. People's ideas about the origins of COVID-19 are like those of other epidemics. It's always some other country or continent. It's often some kind of speculation about military labs or the uncivilized diets or even primitive living conditions of some other group of people. This next slide showed an opinion piece written by a Chinese editor, which was labeled cultural causes of the Chinese epidemic. But in fact, the two causes this author paid most attention to were the kind of strange dietary practices of the Chinese, their habits of purchasing food in so-called wet markets that sold wild meat. But the risks of strange food consumption practices, like the famous wet markets for wild meat in China, highlighted in this so-called cultural analysis, are quite similar to the risks of the strange food production practices in slaughterhouses and meatpacking plants in Iowa or Minnesota or elsewhere in the United States. Both of these ecologies promote species crossover, human-to-human -human transmission, and self-serving denials or minimizations of disease transmission and spread. So no matter where the first case comes from, some kind of event or process begins that can create infection in various vulnerable individuals. This might be a cruise on a boat, a religious festival, a concert, a haircut, time spent visiting various bars, living in high density housing, lots of other possibilities. Given participation in these events, who's likely to be infected, whether they know it or not? Where do they go next? And how do you know? So a few examples of this. There was a Fort Lauderdale beach gathering and a pretty well-known Twitter visualization that's shown here, which gives you a visual image of where people who went to one beach party in Fort Lauderdale, where those people, well, actually, where their cell phones went within the next few weeks. And as you can see on this image, which is actually one of the last images in the time lapse, as you can see here, the entire eastern half of the United States is lit up with places where these cell phones have gone. Another example was a choir practice in Washington at a Skagit County church. This was around March 10. In this case, about 60 choir members got together to sing and celebrate. But unknowingly, at least one member was infected. And eventually, more than 50 people in this choir became infected and three died. Now, this second example is different from the Fort Lauderdale example because in the choir practice example, cases were known, their contacts were traced, they all were quarantined, and in fact, it's said that this epidemic was successfully contained. Let's then move to crisis recognition. So how does the presence of disease in specific groups become a sufficient public concern that the disease is acknowledged to be a danger? That is, we live in an epidemic. An epidemic has begun. Who's considered to be at risk once this starts? How are the infected identified? How well does testing work? When does disease move from the identification of sporadic cases to being labeled as an epidemic or a pandemic? So again, back to some of the early Centers for Disease Control situation summaries. This is one from January 22. It was called a novel coronavirus. The first case in the United States was announced on January 21. There are ongoing investigations. And note this somewhat inappropriate way of representing disease spread, which is showing in red the two places known at that point. Well, I guess Korea's on here too, but three places. But note this inappropriate way of representing the epidemic at that point in time. China, Korea, and the United States were the only nations that were known to have cases at that point. But by simply displaying where cases exist in red, we lose sight of the fact that there were only five cases in the United States at that point in time. And there were, I think, something like 50,000 identified in China at that point in time. Nonetheless, this was one of the official representations that we were given by the Centers for Disease Control. Then later in March, mid-March almost, WHO finally declared this epidemic of COVID-19 
to be a pandemic. There isn't really a good definition of a pandemic. It's generally understood to mean the outbreak of a disease in multiple places disseminated across the world. And the basic rhetorical point is, this is serious. This is widespread. This is something that we all need to care about. So we're told we all need to care. What happens when we start to seek that care? Overwhelmed with COVID cases, we risk neglecting other health functions like immunizations or chronic disease care, geriatric services. This is a major health system challenge. We could see this at the time in this interesting graphic that showed COVID mortality, relative mortality in New York from other diseases in early April. So this thing moves day by day, and I've only given you one picture, but by April 3rd, COVID mortality was almost four times higher than the next highest cause of mortality in New York at that point, which was heart disease. So you can see the importance of the idea introduced at that time of flattening the curve. We had to reduce the number of cases in order to allow the health system to treat those cases and not be overwhelmed, and ideally also to allow ongoing health system functions to continue. That apparently did not work out so well. So during the epidemic, we can see an array of ways in which resource distribution, things like PPEs, or differences in levels of epidemics between rich and poor countries, between slums and wealthy housing, between black Americans and white Americans, among Native Americans, or among Hispanic populations in the US Southwest, among prison populations or immigrant detention centers. There were systematic differences in disease rates and in mortality rates by social groups. This image from the Annals of Epidemiology in mid-May 2020 shows diagnosis rates for COVID in disproportionately black counties in the United States compared with other counties. And you can see pretty clearly the way in which the disease is clustering in the Southeast among largely black populations. Next phase during intervention. Here we have a range of different kinds of interventions taking place. On one hand, social distancing, masks and hand washing. On the other, COVID-19 unemployment payments, rent cancellation and deferral, or Federal Reserve policy changes. We can see a number of ways in which the images of social distancing were seen all over. So this is a photo of the University of Massachusetts campus completely shut down with only the sign visible saying social distancing is required. At this point, it wouldn't have been that difficult. Here, a later Centers for Disease Control message, this is February 26, proclaiming CDC's aggressive response we need to keep in mind that this is a point where the Centers for Disease Control was under pretty strong critique, uh, both politically and scientifically. So we found messages on the Centers for Disease Control site talking about how important it was that the Centers for Disease Control was preparing communities for the spread of COVID-19. And they published things like this infographic trying to tell us all the different ways that they were helping communities to prepare for COVID. There are a variety of very effective interventions for COVID-19. The known effective methods are hand washing for at least 20 seconds, social distancing, mask wearing, and the possibility of a vaccine. But there are an array of problems in the ways in which these behavioral interventions work. Hand washing depends upon the availability of time, not to mention the availability of soap and water. So internationally, the importance and efficacy of hand washing as a COVID intervention is debatable. Social distancing usually works, but under what circumstances do people decide that the power and impact of mass mobilization is more important than the health risk it might create? And can businesses accustomed to a certain level of traffic or occupancy survive at only 25% or 50% of that level? Mask wearing works, protecting the wearer and others 
but different masks filter different types of aerosols and particles, and access to masks is spotty both globally and nationally. Mask wearing itself has become a symbolic act that's gendered, politicized, and emotion laden. These photos are of the empty uh, shelves for masks in our local uh, CVS in Amherst. Uh, this wearing is caring sign is a poster in many of the doors to campus buildings. And the face covers required to ride is a notice of the prohibition of people entering the public buses in the region I live in, uh, Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts, unless they're wearing a mask. Finally, we know that vaccines work and a COVID-19 vaccine may be developed in the next year or two. But even if a successful COVID vaccine is developed, it looks increasingly unlikely that all people in the world would get access. And it looks increasingly unlikely that all people in the USA would want it. We already face differential willingness to immunize children for polio or measles among Hasids in New York, among anti-vaxxers in Southern California, Republicans in the rural West, is it really likely that a COVID-19 vaccine could avoid the misinformation and protests and non-compliance or so-called hesitancy now seen for other vaccines? Next stage is the stage of recovery or recrimination, or both. How do we know when a pandemic is over? Well, counting, good testing, but that's also been problematic. So, here we are, this is this week, uh, second week of June, New York Times headlines, coronavirus updates, cases rising in 21 states, but Washington is turning to other business. Internationally, also, virus rates are continuing to rise, but countries are ending the lockdowns. Populist and despotic leaders seem especially likely to exercise control over messaging, seen in the non-scientific and controversial recommendations by leaders as diverse as Trump in the United States, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Ortega in Nicaragua, or Duterte in the Philippines. But successful leadership in pandemic times is also celebrated. We can see uh, the stories about Jacinda or Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand and her successes in cutting COVID-19 rates on that island nation to zero, or uh, Bonnie Henry in British Columbia, a charismatic and um, quite successful message deliverer in British Columbia who helped to control the infection there. So I rapidly run through a social history about COVID-19. The pandemic is far from over. The stages I've outlined here are being duplicated elsewhere. They're likely to be repeated in our own country. What the research is showing now is that many of the characteristics of epidemics that we ascribe to the infectious agent are better ascribed to the diverse social and cultural environments in which these diseases are transmitted. This next slide is a screenshot of the dashboard of COVID-19 from Johns Hopkins University showing active cases by nation state as well as mortality. And you can see on the figure how rapidly disseminated the epidemic is at this point, and yet at the same time, not only rapidly disseminated, but differentially disseminated. That is, there are pockets of disease in a broad array of places, and those pockets of disease will continue to move from place to place as time passes. So the COVID-19 pandemic is in fact a large and even sometimes bewildering collection of local epidemics that vary both within and between states, within the United States, and vary within and between nation states globally. Another way of thinking about this is that it isn't even only the disease appearance that varies, but it's our thoughts about the disease that also vary. These were some searches I had done using a software program called Google Trends that allows you to look at search term popularity over the past, in this case, six months. So I searched um, for how often people were doing Google searches using the terms COVID testing, COVID vaccine, and COVID treatment. And you can see that these have different proportions in searches over time, rapidly going up in mid-February and really 
kind of leveling off then, although with differential search rates by week. Uh, COVID testing being a larger proportion of searches, COVID vaccine in the middle except for a spike here, and COVID treatment at a lower level. But what's even more interesting is to see how that varies internationally. Because you can see in this next slide that COVID testing is a big concern in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. COVID vaccine, a much larger concern in other areas of the world. East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Africa, most of Latin America, much more concerned with a vaccine than with testing, at least as it manifests itself in Google searches. And COVID treatment, for some reason, I don't understand this, maybe you do, Northeast Africa and the Middle East, and for some reason, Bolivia. My point in showing this is to say that on one hand, we have a broadly disseminated array of hotspots of disease, but we also have a broadly disseminated and different set of understandings and fears and desires to know more about what this disease means and what we might do about it. So in the last five minutes, I want to take you to what COVID-19 looks like in a very different place from our own. I want to take you to the place where I do field work in Northwest coastal Ecuador. The pandemic in Ecuador started later than it did in the United States. Cases started to be counted in late February, clustered in the city of Guayaquil in the southwest corner of the country, as you can see on the map. By mid-March, cases were starting to appear in other provinces and schools and borders were being closed. By early April, Guayaquil's health system was overwhelmed with cases and the world press was full of reports of bodies lying in the streets, unrecovered for days. I won't show you pictures of that. Government case reports were widely considered to be unreliable, both because testing was severely limited and because standard sources of death reports, hospitals, funeral homes, and private physicians were overwhelmed, as were the families of those who died. By May, social distancing, cancellation of schools and of local transportation, and messages about hand washing and mask use were slowing the transmission of the virus in Guayaquil, while cases were starting to increase elsewhere along the coast. This also took place in the highlands and especially in the capital, Quito. The epidemic is continuing to move across space and within the past month has reached the area in northwest coastal Ecuador, where I and my colleagues have been studying disease transmission now for almost 20 years. So how is the epidemic unfolding in our study region in Ecuador? I can address this only very briefly and sketchily because our study has been shut down for almost three months. Basically, COVID-19 is arriving to this largely Afro-Ecuadorian province as the latest in a long string of new diseases. Cholera came as a new disease in the early 1990s, HIV in the late 1990s to this region, dengue fever, Zika virus, and chikungunya in the past decade, and now COVID-19. These infections have regularly traversed the countryside over the past four decades, each bringing new symptoms and ways to label them new treatments, new visits from public health authorities, and for this population, new ways to get sick and die. In addition, this area is subject to heavy flooding that has only become more extreme and more unpredictable as climate change progresses. So river levels, drowned livestock, and housing losses have been more pressing concerns than the latest new virus. Up to this point, and this is up to the past month when cases began to appear in this zone, the major impact of the COVID epidemic in this area has been from the draconian quarantine restrictions. Public transport and road access generally have been shut down, which has dramatically restricted food supplies to the remote villages where we work. Our local research staff also cannot move around to count cases of infectious diseases in this area. So instead, they've agreed to make thousands of free masks for residents and to periodically distribute food so that people don't starve. So this is a short clip of a canoe ride. It's a dugout canoe with an outboard motor on the back to deliver rice to some of the villagers in these more remote areas. The story of COVID-19 at population scale is obviously unfinished. 
because the pandemic is multiple epidemics it has stopped in some places slowed in others and has only just started in still others and because this is a social pandemic as well as a viral one the behavioral and economic costs will continue to add up for years to come we are already celebrating some leaders for their success while blaming others for their failure It'll be interesting to look back in five years, and I think it will actually take that long, to see who really deserved a claim and who miserably failed us all. But one thing should be clear. The resolution of this pandemic will not and cannot come with the invention of a vaccine. This virus floats on currents of social inequality. It thrives where public health systems are broken. It grows most easily where it isn't being counted. Even if or when we do develop a vaccine for this one, if we fail to resolve the underlying human causes of this pandemic, we only guarantee that another one will follow. I'll stop here for a few questions, but I did want to mention that I've included a list of recommended COVID-19 visualizations and a few relevant websites. I hope these are interesting and useful. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. It was a great presentation. And uh, we're waiting for some questions to come in from the audience, which is a large audience. Last time I looked, we were at 147. So there's obviously a lot of interest in what you had to say. Let me start with one question. It's more, more on the biology side of it than the social side. But one of the things that is, is there another epidemic that you're familiar with that has the, the same spectrum of uh, effects that, um, COVID-19 does. I, I can't think of an example. You mentioned typhoid Mary, but what's one of the reasons why the disease is going to be so persistent is the impact ranges from essentially none, people who are completely unaffected, I mean, asymptomatic and unaffected, to, you know, patients who in some cases uh, die within four or five days of, uh, you know, the first expression of the illness. So, so then you face, I mean, um, like I've never heard anybody refer to Ebola as a nothing burger, but but you see that expression um, applied to COVID-19 by segments of the population that think we're overreacting and that the whole thing is wildly e exaggerated. So I wondered if there are other examples. I mean, is there something uniquely difficult about this particular disease that is that beyond your experience and your level of familiarity? with pandemics worldwide? Oh, we, we're, we're not getting your audio. Is your, you turned on? Now I'm good. Yeah, there you go. Okay, sorry. So it's a good question because it's complicated. Um, and I'm not a microbiologist or biologist. Of course. Um, so I don't pretend to, to give you the, the perfect answer. Um, I, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that um, very rarely does everybody get sick from an infectious agent. Mm -hmm. We have differential levels of exposure, and given exposure, we have different physiologies, different levels of um, functioning immune systems, and a whole array of ways in which our individual and our group susceptibility, as I was talking about, um, differentially uh, predict or change the likelihood that we will become infected and have symptoms if we are infected mm -hmm. and survive if we have symptoms and so forth through all those different stages. So um, that's kind of an overlay for any kind of infectious agent. But mm -hmm. what you're talking about in thinking about the difference between something like Ebola versus something like COVID-19 is um, I think probably best thought about evolutionarily. That is um, the sweet spot for especially respiratory infections is that point at which you don't kill your host too quickly. Um, your host can walk around and spread you the virus uh, easily. And in fact, given that kind of spread, when other people are infected, they don't necessarily know it. So you have some point of what gets called asymptomatic transmission. Mm 
or asymptomatic infection, wherein you are fully capable of transmitting that virus, and yet you don't know it and nobody else does either. And that doesn't happen in the same way with a disease like Ebola. So um, that kind of evolutionary difference in the virus dramatically changes the ability of that virus to replicate quickly, spread itself across the landscape, and reach the kinds of levels of contagion that we see with COVID. Ebola burned itself out quite quickly. Um, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, that um, came up, I think it's related to camel as the animal host, uh, has a much higher level of um, deaths. So you end up burning, the disease burns itself out in essence because the human population dies before it can transmit uh, the disease broadly enough to be able to create the kind of pandemic on the scale that we see with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Paul? Uh, yeah, Jim, thank you. It was a fascinating presentation. C can you hear me all right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I have a number of questions from the audience, but if I can indulge myself, I, your, your thesis that uh, natural history of, of a disease is really a social history of disease dovetails with lots of anthropological thinking. I mean, reassembling the social, going back to Latour and so on. Uh, I work in a place where there's a lot of hurricanes and one of the kind of comparable things that I've seen in the Caribbean is the different societal responses to what we call a natural disaster are dramatic. Um, Cuba versus Haiti, for instance, the, the effects of a particular hurricane would might vary incredibly. And it's a similar kind of uh, approach. The, I think Anthony Oliver Smith was the anthropologist who really brought this forward in anthropological thought first, which is that natural disasters are actually social disasters. It's a similar thesis. So I guess my question right off the bat would be, is, is that a comparable thing? Or is there something distinct about epidemiology that's a little different than that sort of anthropological thinking about disaster? So I guess I'm not completely sure whether you're asking me about the difference between thinking epidemiologically about uh, what we call natural disaster versus uh, natural history of disease, or whether you're asking me about the difference between an anthropological and an epidemiological approach to either one of those. No, the former. Uh, that, in other words, is it really the same sort of uh, processual, uh, is it the same sort of process saying, okay, this is actually a social dis um social disease rather than natural disease, a social disaster rather than natural disaster, or is there some distinction specific to the epidemiology that you would you could use to elaborate your own work compared to say Anthony Oliver Smith's work on disaster? Yeah, I think there, there are a number of ways, um, and that's partly why I, I thought that making the um, social connections to the CDC model of the natural history of disease, as well as the more population level um, portrayal of that group process made sense. So what, what you have in, in, in disasters is some kind of event that everybody agrees upon is that cataclysm. So you, you're not having the first couple of uh, stages of susceptibility and the array of ways in which things are perceived as taking place or not. Um, I mean, yes, you have ecological susceptibility to um, the unfolding of the disaster given the presence of the hurricane, for example. So different kinds of housing qualities will result in different kinds of outcomes. But I think that from my own perspective, what's interesting about the epidemiology is the ways in which um, even how we understand what may be upon us and whether there is something upon us in those earlier stages has an, an array of um, kind of social strata that um, differentially expose different kinds of people, both to the onset, but also to the interpretation of whether anything is happening at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then like that process of what is a symptom? Um, how do we know what we suffer from? We know that the kinds of ways that people label the things that they suffer from differ dramatically across the globe. And yeah, I suppose you can make the argument that in the case of a hurricane or an earthquake, um, different people will have different levels of suffering. Mm 
but I'm not sure you have the same kind of variability in outcomes, um, wherein if you're in uh, Ayurvedic health system and you're trying to explain what you suffer from and make sense of it, um, you're going to end up with a very different kind of outcome and explanation and therapeutic uh, recommendations than you would if you're inside a biomedical system or other kinds of medical systems. So I think that the, the, the way in which health itself is defined, the way in which suffering is perceived and defined, the kinds of multiple pathways to resolving that suffering unfold is, is fairly different from the natural disaster model. That would be how I would start to, to answer the question. I, I see that we've got a question uh, here from Alan Swedland. I know you know Alan Swedland. He lives in Pioneer Valley, an expert on epidemics as well, and gave one of our first uh, online um, presentations after the shutdown. Um, so his question is, can you say a little bit more about how climate change may be affecting uh, recent timing or patterns of pandemics? I presume he means globally. Yeah, so climate change in making um, all kinds of weather events more extreme um, has an array of kind of cascading outcomes. On one hand, you have people in movement based on their inability to maintain residence in the place where they were before because there are more typhoons or hurricanes coming through because the mean uh, temperature has gotten beyond what's perceived as being bearable, because the crops that people used to raise, uh, that people are familiar with raising, no longer work in that area, and so forth. So you have populations increasing in movement, which makes all kinds of um, epidemiologic changes take place. Um, you also have things like water scarcity creating increased political conflicts or forming a part of an increasing number of types of political conflicts. So it's not just people moving because they're uncomfortable it's or because they can't grow what they used to. It's also because they have to, because uh, wars between nation states are forcing people uh, to be in places where they didn't used to be. And so you have overcrowding, you have substandard housing conditions, you have the inability to um, have clean water, to be able to wash your hands, as I mentioned during the talk, and another uh, or a host of other arrays in which um, ecological conditions for prevention, behavior-based prevention, become uh, impossible. So those would be two or three of the ways that I think that climate change makes a difference, that the, the inability to maintain uh, the kinds of balances or the amount of time between punctuated imbalances are both uh, greater in intensity and um, shorter and uh, more, more frequent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paul? Uh, I have a question here. Um, if a vaccine is one of our best chances to beat COVID-19, but we don't have a successful history of making effective vaccines for coronaviruses, what do you think our chances of making a successful vaccine for COVID-19 are for the next year, within the next year? So not being a virologist or immunologist, I, I would probably prefer to have somebody like that answer that question. I think that what I was trying to focus on and something that I know more about, which is really, um, I spent the first ooh, probably eight years of my career paying a lot of attention to compliance with therapeutic regimens. And I was particularly interested in medication consumption, but I increasingly got interested in other kinds of compliance with uh, behavioral regimens and uh, people's willingness to wash hands or build latrines or an array of things like that. So I think that um, in some ways the, the intriguing and, and, and difficult fact here is that hand washing and mask use and social distancing are fairly effective interventions. And it's possible that if, and in fact, I think some friends of mine, not I think, some friends of mine are saying that if human beings were good at hand washing and social distancing and mask use, that would be sufficient to take down um, this epidemic, maybe sooner than a vaccine would. Because the problem with vaccines isn't just, and it's not simply just, it's an incredibly complex process, but even after having the vaccine, One's ability to distribute it, to overcome people's lack of um, desire to, or su to overcome people's suspicions of what a vaccine is, a government's motivations in um, developing such a thing and asking everybody to have it, 
the, the simple stupidity of the last mile challenge of getting the vaccine into the hands of uh, refugee populations and uh, poor places that are just difficult to get to in any point in time, um, people who are hard to reach, people who don't understand, that's not a straightforward public health system. So, you know, there are ways in which developing the vaccine is the easy part, which is a crazy thing to say, I think, for people to hear even, but developing the vaccine is the easy part. Distributing the vaccine, getting the compliance with the vaccine that you need to get coverage, and catching up to all the ways in which vaccine uh, utilization at this point around the world is gravely disrupted is a serious, serious challenge for the world to handle. So the likelihood that polio will be eliminated at this point is much lower than it was a year ago. Uh, the likelihood of measles epidemic springing up to kill young kids all over the world is much, much higher today than it was three or four months ago and so forth and so on, almost ad infinitum, down the list of vaccine preventable diseases. So, so that's why I ended by saying it's necessary but not sufficient because there are so many other problems that have sprung up in the course of these um, lockdowns and uh, disruptions of travel and commerce that it's gonna take human society a couple of years and maybe five to 10 to be able to recover from some of the other you could call them ancillary, you could call them coexistent, um, but the kind of sequelae inside the social and medical systems that take place when not only is there not a vaccine for COVID, but there are other perfectly uh, functioning vaccine programs, um, but previously perfectly functioning vaccine programs that are now completely disrupted. And so millions of children are missing those vaccine schedules and that will take quite a long time to catch up on. Um, I've got a question here. I don't know who it's from, but I'm, I'm going to put a slightly different spin on it. But here's the way it was written. Flattening the curve was to help doctors, first responders, et cetera, not to be overwhelmed when they're serving the sick. It was not to end the virus. So the question is, why are people shocked when we see spikes in cases, uh, in, cases in places beginning to open up? Isn't that what we we're expecting? I guess what I would, it's a fair question. Um, what I would add to that is, and I could see this right at the beginning, but it's more and more prominent. One of the arguments is that we have to just accept, there's a kind of um, calculus of lethality that we're willing to accept in the interests of just of society continuing to move forward with basic economic activities. Um, and I've argued with friends, I have a doctor friend here in town who's brilliant and I have tremendous respect for him, but from his perspective, no level of lethality, lethality is acceptable um, is an acceptable trade-off, um, but clearly there are different opinions on that. And um, I wonder what you thought about that, because again, um, it's rare, at least in my lifetime, I've never seen a case where people are willing to say, you know what, um, if 5% of the population dies, that's the price we're gonna have to pay just to feed people and keep school going and you know maintain the balance of trade or whatever. Um, it's just sort of shocking to hear things put that way, but it's not completely wrong. And I just wondered what you thought of, how do we work our way through the moral and logistical issues raised by those kinds of questions? I love <laughs> the simple questions you're asking me, Michael. <laughs> just, no, I, I know, it's not, it's not an easy one. And, <laughs> no, and, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an easy one. And I, and I think that in, I have to start by saying that, that part of the, the dubious wonder of COVID as a pandemic is that it at least ideally gives us a chance to ask these questions and to, to come to terms with what, it, what good answers might look like. Mm -hmm. um, so much as I think it was Shirley Lindenbaum in, in Kuru Sorcery who talked about how um, diseases reveal fault lines in society, um, mm -hmm. so also is COVID giving us a chance and a necessity um, to reach a set of decisions in different ways in different countries and different cultures about what we truly care about and what kind of society we want to have. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think it was the lieutenant governor in Texas can say, I'm willing to sacrifice myself and I think other old people should be willing to sacrifice themselves so that younger people in society can um, continue. Uh, and if that's the price we need to pay for opening up the economy, that's a, a just and legitimate uh, price. Um, I think ideally that's a debate um, rather than an imposition on the part of a government. 
And I think that there are ways in which many of the so-called uh, economic um, necessities, um, business must return, profit must be made, exports must be continued, um, that, that are easy to say, um, hard to accomplish, but, but too easily tossed off without sufficient thought about whether in fact that does need to continue in the way that it does. So for example, I was reading the Times this morning about uh, pork exports to China. It doesn't matter where the pork's being exported to, but some of the claims being made about the necessity of keeping the nation's meat, the US nation's meat supply going were made not because it was important to keep the US nation national meat supply going, although in part that was the case, but they were also made because it was important for those companies to be able to continue to export pork to China. So, you know, who's paying the price? Those kinds of migrant workers who are on those lines that are moving that quickly, who are so close to one another, um, if what they're being told is you're feeding your people, you're feeding your nation, maybe they're going to consider that an acceptable cost. But if what they're told is, this is so that we can make more money for this company by exporting, by continuing or exporting more pork to China, I doubt very much they're going to accept that burden. So I, I think that part of what I end up thinking about, and I don't have answers to this, just kind of continuing questions as we all do, is how do we have you know, real conversations when we have some sense of what the prices are that we're being asked to pay? We don't know those prices and we don't know the costs. And I guess what I mean by prices versus costs is we don't have the testing information yet to know how many people are getting sick in these circumstances. So we can't make accurate judgments. We're not sure who's paying the costs and who's reaping the profit from some of these changes. You know, the kinds of massive disbursements of financial aid that were being made to very large companies because this is the only way to save the economy. How many of those companies really needed that? Well, clearly not all of them did, given how many gave it back. And we still have no sense of the true story of what proportion of those uh, gigantic expenditures were in fact going where people said they were going and were needed to the extent that people said they were needed. So I, I think it's very difficult for an educated person to, to reach an educated conclusion because we simply don't have the information that we would expect to be able to have to be able to make an educated conclusion about those kinds of challenges. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of testing, in the absence of my ability still, which is uh, almost a crime, I would say, in the absence of my ability to say, I want to know whether I've been exposed yet or not, the difficulties that I have of reaching an answer to that are far too great at this point. So we don't have the ability to be able to make educated, informed judgments about our risk, about the likelihood we'll be infected, about the likelihood we'll infect others. And trying to, you know, there are a set of rational or supposedly rational decisions being made about the economic benefits of reopening. Um, we don't have the information to know whether in fact those benefits are as great and the, and the danger as high as we've been told. Clearly we recognize the unemployment is real um, and probably larger than what's been measured. But there's so much unsteadiness, so much shakiness, so much uncertainty around so many of the numbers that we want that I think it's part of the of the COVID epidemic's challenge to the world is decision making under conditions of uncertainty. And mm -hmm. how might we have more certainty? Because I think we could actually have more certainty than we do. And from my perspective, that's that's the part of this that's bordering on criminal, as I said before. Thank you. Um, we have a question here. What is your opinion of herd immunity versus a vaccine for eradicating coronavirus? So um, the problem with herd immunity is that you need to have pretty high levels of exposure before that's a reasonable way to um, have a population develop resistance so that new infections no longer um, spread rapidly across the population. We are nowhere near the levels of um, infection and resistance. And again, speaking of lack of information, it's still completely unclear scientifically what level and what duration um, immunity, post COVID infection immunity is like. So um, you don't know if you've gotten sick that in fact, you're not very likely to get sick again. If it turns out that you're not very likely to get sick again, it's still unclear how long that condition would last. 
And so the notion that herd immunity is going to be the salvation for this particular kind of disease with the characteristics that this virus has uh, just doesn't seem to be working out. Um, England tried it, it blew up in their face. Um, Sweden tried it, it worked maybe okay, but maybe blowing up in their face. Again, we don't have real good information on that yet. Um, Bolsonaro had the idea that uh, herd, Im herd immunity was going to be the salvation for Brazil. That's totally backfired, and I think Brazil has either the highest infection rates or the second highest infection rates in the world at this point in time. So no, in policy terms, uh, herd immunity does not appear to be the kind of um, effective uh, alternative to a vaccine. Wait a minute, just to follow that up, I mean, for as you said, for herd immunity to have any chance of actually being effective, and I agree that there are all these uncertainties, you have to have vast numbers of infected people, right? So, um, I mean, it's 60, 70 percent of the population has to have been infected, and presumably that also is associated with significant mortality. And am I missing something here? I mean, somebody like Bolsonaro is just saying, let, let's let everybody get it, and that will take the hindmost, and then we can move on, essentially. Right, and I'm saying I, that's a lousy policy. That's that's a deadly policy. Sorry, I thought I that was clear. I don't that's, disagree. With herd immunity is not an answer for this for this disease. Yeah. So there's a question here from Karen, um, and I'm going to rephrase it slightly, but is, the way it's written is: Might a national strategy have made a difference in the disease's impact, um, rather than leaving things up to individual states? And even aside from the whole question of whether the states are fighting with each other for PPE and things like that, in a country as I mean, it's interesting that the successful cases, and you and I were talking about this before we started the webinar, like Iceland, which was just written up um, by Betsy Colbert in The New Yorker, or New Zealand, a lot of them are islands, um, and Paul mentioned Cuba, too. Um, not all of them, and maybe South Korea is a successful case, though things have sort of gone sour more recently. Um, in a country as big and as open and as ornery as the United States, where people don't like being told what to do clearly, would it have made a big difference, do you think, in the end, if we'd had a, a highly organized national strategy? And what what would it have looked like, I guess? That's, whoa. <laughs> so um, would it have made a difference? Absolutely. Um, because organized health systems allow coordinated responses to these kinds of um, unexpected occurrences of, of new um, viruses coming into contact with human populations. Mm. So um, had our federal government not disbanded, uh, a functioning global pandemic surveillance system that was actually looking for these things in 40 different countries, um, we might have seen this one earlier or things like this in the future. Um, had um, individual states, as you mentioned, not had to compete with one another for the personal protective equipment in the early stages and even to the present, um, that would have made a difference. Um, had we had a functioning Centers for Disease Control um, which would have been much more active and proactive in uh, establishing uh, rapid population-based, community-based testing programs, we would have been able to have a much clearer sense of all the uh, uh, hotspots um, that were starting in the early days of the epidemic. Um, so I'm certainly not trying to suggest that this all could have been resolved with uh, a real health system which we do not have. We do not have a functioning national health system like a number of other countries in the world do. Had that system you know, been in place, had it been more functioning as a system as it has been in the past, yeah, I think we could have done a much better job because there are so many ways in which our, um, our epidemic ignorance of how many people were exposed, where the disease were com was coming from, um, how, how easy or difficult it might be to kind of do the contact tracing to tamp down the hotspots that inevitably occur, uh, we could have handled this better. And I've seen a number of studies that have suggested that death rates would have been lower and um, infection rates lower had we gotten testing started earlier and had we known more uh, about the kind of epidemiologic data that we should have known about. And that I think we would have known about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And certainly 30 years ago, when we actually had a much better functioning public health system. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have a question from Frank. Uh, I think of Esmeraldas as somewhat isolated. Do more limited transportation options make contact, contact tracing easier? <laughs> 
Well, okay. The problem with the question, it's, it's a fine question, but the problem with the premise of the question is um, contact tracing and distance isn't just about um, uh, geographic distance. It's also about technological distance, for example. So how easy, contact tracing is relatively straightforward when you can call people on a cell phone and ask them who they've been hanging out with and then call those people and so forth and so forth and follow the, the uh, network chain that way. Uh, contact tracing is not at all straightforward and what you have to do is get on a dugout canoe and motor up river for three and a half hours um, to get to the first rural village where you discover that everybody had been to a festival the week before three villages up the river. So it's, it's not straightforward, I'm afraid. Um, Potentially, if um, intervillage travel is constrained and episodic, and you can figure out what those rhythms are of exchange, yes, that might make contact tracing for particular kinds of events more straightforward. But I think that if we think about contact tracing only from the point of view of a US system, where you can call people on the phone to figure out who they've seen, uh, that's actually not gonna work very well in probably more than half of the world, and I'm sorry, about more than half the people in the world. And so it's it's quite a challenge to try to figure out how to do that. The questions are flooding in. I don't know if we're gonna to get to all of them, but here's one that sort of puzzled me too. It's from Don. Uh, can you explain why outcomes in large groups such as during the Florida spring break vary geographically? For example, we're much more intense in the, mid, in the Northeast, sorry, but less so in the Midwest. Um, when students from both areas were present in large numbers? Is it just one of these mysteries of science or is there some understanding that you have that could explain it? Well, I'm not gonna complain, to, I'm not gonna claim to have this, the, the understanding to be able to explain it, but I think it's important to consider that um, the ability of, of um, pathogens to travel is in part also a function of the abilities of humans to travel and what kinds of humans go to different kinds of places at different times. That's the person, place, and time epidemiologic triad that's used so often in standard outbreak investigations in epidemiology. Who and where and when. So there are um, some interesting studies of um, tuberculosis transmission that were very difficult to figure out. Um, it turned out that there was a bar uh, in, I think this was in West Texas, that was a kind of a straight bar, bar for straight people during the day and a gay bar at night. And so you had, even though the, the, the place of infection was identified, you had different kinds of people going there at different times. So I'm not sure how useful this is in the Fort Lauderdale example in particular, but I think that in trying to figure out where people would have gone, I think you need to overlay that beach onto a set of social connections, universities, at what places, and I don't know this in sufficient detail to be able to explain it, but what, what kinds of universities geographically go to the east and southeast, which universities geographically go to Mexico and Cancun, which universities you know, go other places, what kinds of preferences are there inside those social networks for um, gathering together in different places? So I, I think you need some data about um, social network density, about party scenes about go-to places for holidays and kind of even some historical information about where the undergraduates from Caltech go as opposed to the uh, undergrads from the University of Florida. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, um, I was just thinking about the University of Chicago where people, where fun goes to die, so we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Not a big party school as I understand it. <laughs> um, the question from Mike, does how people characterize symptoms and what people look for typically change during an epidemic, i.e. Initial, initially people are looking for pulmonary symptoms, but now they're looking for blood or organ symptoms? That's his first question. And the second question is, have any cultures incorporated or transmitted how to avoid epidemics? So does this, do what people look for change and have any cultures figured out a way to um, avoid ep epidemics? So, so for the first part, absolutely. Um, I mean, there, we are, we're swimming in this cultural sea 
um, the, the currents in that sea are changing over time as we consume different kinds of media, as different kinds of stories circulate, as we're exposed to different kinds of fears about what we may suffer from or, or as we're being told what we already do suffer from. So um, this is an interesting part of the, of the modeling challenge when people are trying to figure out future contact and contagion rates because you have to assume and incorporate inside your modeling equations that people's behavior changes in the course of an epidemic. So as people start to feel more menaced, they may be more likely in a larger proportion will adopt preventive behaviors as their fear of infection wanes, they're less likely to continue that. And so you end up with these very complex equations um, that are, are interacting uh, dynamics of ways in which people's ideas about what's happening changes in accord with what they're hearing, which changes the progress of the epidemic, which changes what they're hearing, and this stuff moves around. So that's, that's the first one. Um, with respect to the second, I'm thinking about the famous uh, Kikwit handshake in the first Ebola epidemic, where because people were starting to understand that there was something going on in touching bodies, um, that they really needed to figure out another way of greeting one another. And that was the famous you know, elbow, elbow knocking from two different people that became a way of shaking hands in a safe form. So I, you know, that's kind of a, a let's call it a relatively um, unimportant behavioral change. Um, but yeah, that was a way in which there was adaptation to um, perceived understandings of the circulation of the agent um, in accordance with a set of pattern forms of greeting. Um, you know, again, I like I like Shirley Lindenbaum's book on crude sorcery because it's so dramatic and so different in thinking about ways in which people responded to that kind of epidemic in a very different place, very different kinship context, very different set of understandings of what science is and you know what risk is and what you need to do about it. Um, so there are some good anthropology books that explore um, ways in which people's responses to epidemics uh, develop over time and um, and well, let's just say evolve and change over time. Do you, uh, do you think we'll ever go back to bro hugs and handshakes and so on when this is all done? Or do you think there'll really be a permanent? I mean, the three of us are Latin Americanists. And, you know, one of the things about working in Latin America, you get used to hugging people you don't know very well and levels of touching that in sort of Anglo-America at least used to be uh, unusual. Um, but it's hard to imagine that that's all going to be abandoned. Um, right. But it might. Right. Yeah. Well, and, I, and again, I think we need to get more complex in thinking about who is already adopting and who's already not adopting. Um, what's the likelihood of those who haven't yet adopted a new behavior changing toward it? What's the likelihood of those who have already adopted a new behavior reverting to the old behavior? And how might those rates of adoption and reversion differentiate or be different among different kinds of groups? So the college students that I teach, you know, what proportion of them we're actively social distancing all along, you know, well, that's some known quantity. It's probably not 100%. How likely is that behavior to continue once they come back to campus? Well, I think it's pretty likely it's not going to continue in the same way that it was previously. So um, on the other hand, um, I and my 65 plus uh, friends are probably likelier to maintain some of those more distant social interactions. We're all complaining about missing hugs, and I think we're all looking forward to hugging at the first opportunity. And those of us who read the New York Times are reading instructions for how to hug safely in the New York Times, which probably also <laughs> manifests the depth of this kind of uh, dilemma um, for North American society, at least. So we'll have different responses in different groups, and um, some of those groups are going to be sicker as a result of those behaviors. Some of those groups are going to be healthier as a result of those behaviors, um, but it's by no means going to be a universal and consistent uh, response. We, we have a board member we haven't met yet, John Yeda Phillips, who's a, I think associate provost at uh, Indiana University. And my understanding from him is that Indiana has decided to bring students back for the fall, but one of the things they're doing is asking them to take a pledge to maintain social distancing. And, wow. <laughs> and as somebody, I have a daughter who will be going back to college and they've announced that it will be on campus. I mean, how, you know, in person, how that will be negotiated in real life, um, I just can't imagine. But yeah. there's got to be a cultural dimension to students' willingness to obey these rules or just to say that doesn't apply to me. Well, we know how well those rules do with respect to limiting, um, you know, alcohol fuel violence. We know how well those rules work with respect to limiting alcohol consumption. 
we know how well those rules work on um, you know date rape and date-based violence, and we know how well those rules work in limiting drug consumption on college campuses across the country. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not at all uh, optimistic about the ability of signing a pledge. It's you know maybe it's a new kind of COVID virginity test or something, but I don't think those work very well. Paul, well, uh, we have a question from Kay. Hi, Jim. I love your phrase that the virus, quote, floats on currents of inequality. Is this the case for most diseases or is this more true of COVID-19? And if so, why? Yeah, that's the big epidemiological dilemma. Um, under what circumstances is, let's say, inequality a fundamental component of disease transmission? Um, and or a fundamental component of um, disease recovery um, and or mortality. I think most epidemiologists would say in almost all cases, inequality is a necessary component of analysis um, because there's so many things um, that stem from, ride on, co-occur with um, uh, inequality and differential power allocation and access that um, uh, disease incidence, disease prevalence, disease treatment, disease prevention are all influenced by this. Now, how would you begin to say which kinds of diseases are most heavily influenced by inequality? Um, that would be an interesting thing to think about, and I should probably take more time to think about it than I have remaining in this presentation. But um, let's just say, you know, it, it, poverty, so-called race, I keep saying so-called race because it's a social construct more than a biological construct, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Um, so inequality, so-called race, um, you know, a variety of kinds of um, levels of education, um, different kinds of environments with respect to living conditions, social density, housing density, um, those are all incredibly important for the kinds of diseases for which proximity matters. So um, respiratory infections, you know, certain manifestations of poverty are going to be incredibly important, especially how much time you spend with lots of other people, whether you know them or not. Um, things like cancer, however, or hypertension or diabetes aren't so much necessarily about housing density as they are about ability to recognize symptoms, ability to get care, a sense that a system um, is paying attention to the kinds of symptoms that people are complaining about. Some of the differences in black versus white rates of cancer detection are based on the extent to which at the population level, physicians appear to be able to listen to black women complaining of uh, pain in their chests. And um, if you don't hear people saying that, then you don't diagnose the cancer as early as you might when you listen better for other kinds of populations. So again, we need to kind of differentiate the way in which these different kinds of diseases manifest themselves and then the different parts of social life that are energized or are made relevant by virtue of the symptomatology or the spread or the, the etiology of these different kinds of health conditions. I could go on for a long period of time, but I shouldn't, so I'll wait for the next question, sorry. It's fine, I just got an email from Frank Chambers who sent me a video that's the pledge to protect our Purdue community. I guess it's a similar thing where people are pledging to you know play by the rules to protect the spread of the disease. I obviously can't watch it right now, but it's, yeah. This is an approach that some institutions are taking. Um, I have one a question from John I wanted to ask you, and you've, you've addressed uh, uh, somewhat uh, earlier, but he asks, um, how effective is contract, uh, contact tracing with extensive testing? Um, to which he adds, and how much, how much or how many resources would it be necessary in the US to make, make it effective? Um, I was thinking of the Chinese case where I gather, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, if if you tested positive and you're the only person in your family that tested positive, they just took you away to some you know isolated place. They didn't allow you to stay with your family because in many in most cases you would probably infect them. I, it's hard to imagine that in the United States. Is that actually yeah. happening anywhere in the United States right now? No, 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 no. But we need to be really careful to differentiate between contact tracing and quarantine. Um, right. I'm so sorry. Right. Okay. But so, isn't the whole point of contact tracing is to then you know identify who is in 
possible contact and find out and then have them tested uh, and then presumably do something if they test positive? Yes, but what they do if they test positive is social distancing and hand washing and mask use. And yeah. So, you, you know, a lot of those stupid, simple behavioral changes can really dramatically change the spread and the probability of spread of this virus. So, I mean, again, it's, it's part of this Public health seems very dumb sometimes. I mean, you know, it comes down to condom use for sexually transmitted infections. Uh, it comes down. It comes down to hand washing and control of fecal material for diarrheal diseases. Um, and and yet, despite the the seeming simplicity and or stupidity of these answers, they are very effective. They can be very effective um, preventive or um, treatment based on treatment isn't quite the right word treatment at the population level let's call them preventive mechanisms or control mechanisms of control so contact tracing it works because you're limiting the subsequent spread of infection from any, any individual and if you do it well it works very well you have to be able to identify cases quickly you have to be able to identify contacts quickly, and you have to have a population that's going to be willing to follow the instructions that are being given to try to limit that subsequent spread. Mm -hmm. None of those are simple things. Um, so Massachusetts has started a pretty extensive contact tracing program. I think they hired, and I'm not completely clear on these numbers, somewhere between five and 10,000 people to do it. I think it was at least five. Um, how well is it working? I don't know yet. The epidemic curve in Massachusetts is going down. How much of that to attribute to contact tracing? I don't know. Public health experts more versed in this and more knowledgeable of the policy than I am would be better able to answer that. But it certainly seems to be possible. Um, are we willing to pay the cost? Well, where else are those expenses going into now? You know, how many hundreds of millions of masks? How many hundreds of millions of gowns, how many hundreds of millions, well, how many billions of dollars would be invested in the vaccine race, which will only have three maybe winners at the end of it, and how much money gets spent on that. Um, these are simple, and they can be costly preventive measures, but they can work. I think that we have such a fondness for the higher tech solutions that we tend to dismiss and not pay sufficient attention to some of these simpler practices. And, and that's, again, kind of a public health generalization because it's a lot more fun to invest in, I don't know, instead of a condom than it is to invest in a condom. And it's a lot more fun to invest in special fancy water filters than it is to clean up a municipal water supply and building latrines and so forth and so on and these different kinds of um, uh, public health challenges. Again, I think I'm starting to go on, so I'll stop. That's okay. Paul, why don't you ask one and then I'll finish with the last and we'll wind up here. Sure. Um, we have a question from Laura. Um, how do you see society changing to adjust to the long-term impacts of this virus? Yeah. I, I, it, it depends. Um, yes, societies will change. Um, to what extent will we feel that we don't dare ever again sacrifice our economy in service of um, keeping people alive. What's the likely outcome of that moral equation? I don't know yet. I think different countries might end up with different answers, which scares me to death. Not quite to death, but scares me. Um, to what extent do we end up feeling and recognizing and understanding, because it's much more than feeling, that our health is the product of those around us, not just our individual actions. I think that there are other places in the world where that idea of social medicine and of social connectedness and of the relevance of our social connectedness to our individual health is much more understandable, much more available. I think it's a particularly difficult idea in this place at this time um, for us, for we in the United States to accept, um, but that can change through time. And depending on how this epidemic goes, depending on how we handle it or they handle it, depending on who's doing the handling here, 
we might end up with a very different sense of the importance of society, of social connections, of equality, of, of justice um, as important um, components of human social interaction that also make a difference. And, and here's where it becomes even more interesting because if we were to discover that we, that we felt we could make a difference in how we design our society, if we could pay more attention to justice, uh, the kinds of impacts that would have upon our communal health is practically incalculable, given how important inequality and injustice are to so many diseases. So if it were possible that COVID were able to teach us that, um, that communal and community-based responses to diseases are the most effective and over time actually the least costly, that would be a gift that COVID would be giving to us that would echo in a whole array of other domains and might be a great outcome. Then there are the questions about, you know, how much do we realize that we care about society and about um, our friends? Um, can we uh, continue to use technologies to reach out more often and better to people who haven't been reached out as well to? Um, can we better understand the differential risks of exposure to a host of infectious agents for those who work on um, in slaughterhouses, um, for those who work at our local uh, stop and shop grocery store, um, for those who are cleaning up the food trays and changing diapers for babies and for elderly. Um, these are all fundamental sources of difference in our society and in societies everywhere. And they, again, echo and um, lots of diseases float upon those currents, not just COVID. So it's possible that COVID could, could teach us some of those kinds of things. I prefer to be an optimist rather than a pessimist. And I could tell the exact same story that I just told in the opposite way and in my uh, duller and darker um, and more hopeless moments, um, I listen to our leaders and I am disconsolate and quite pessimistic about the future. Well, I think we should end on that note. Jim, thank you so much for a very uh, engaging talk. We really appreciate it. I apologize to those who there were a bunch of terrific questions that came in, but we're well over our 75 minute uh, limit. And um, we obviously this is a conversation to be continued on many fronts, but we really appreciate your educated approach. Thanks to Paul, too, for his for pitching in in the Q&A. And uh, thanks to all of our all of those of you who participated, members or soon to be members. Um, we hope to see you again at our next event. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jim. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks,